thanks to the entire Apex Art team for helping to uh, make the nature of the beast happen. Um, certainly thanks to my friends at Morbid Anatomy as well, uh, sort of co uh, co curating this project with me. And I'm, I'm very excited today. Um, certainly the the exhibit as a standalone. Uh, I, I, I hope people enjoy it and get a lot out of it. But but these events um, from a, a public uh, education standpoint, I think really do um, extend what we're trying to do uh, with respect to engaging and educating people about this rather peculiar art form that we all, uh, or at least many of us have come to, to love and have a true passion for. And certainly um, that, that passion is very strong with our guest today, uh, Divya Nantraman, who um, I consider a friend and I'm very happy that she's been willing to share some of her time with us today to talk about taxidermy really from the process of how it's created. Um, I certainly get those questions a lot, but not being a taxidermist or skilled in the creative arts more generally, um, I often have to defer on a lot of those questions and, and Divya is certainly uh, an expert. Um, she's also going to be focused today on aspects of the process that include and are focused on restoration and maintenance, where as a collector, always something very important um, to, to focus on as far as how you're going to maintain taxidermy that you may have acquired in a responsible uh, manner and in a way that is consistent with preserving value and certainly uh, making the pieces last the test of time, because ultimately this is, is really about uh, that sort of piece of immortality. How do you defy uh, and um, fight against the ravages of time that uh, we're ultimately all uh, subject to? And taxidermy is one method to sort of escape some of those constraints in a metaphorical way. So uh, with, that, with that said, I, I do want to formally introduce Divya, who's one of New York City's premier taxidermists. She's an award-winning licensed professional preserving animals with honor and compassion. Her work seeks to combine the demonstrative aspect of science with the symbolic introspective nature of art and uses taxidermy to engage diverse audiences with questions about mortality, wildlife, and conservation. Her clients range from museums to collectors and designers and even everyday naturalists. In addition to running Gotham's Taxidermy, her studio, Divya is the co-author of the book Stuffed Animals, A Modern Guide to Taxidermy, and works part-time at the esteemed studio of George Dante, which specializes in museum taxidermy and historic conservation. She enjoys demystifying taxidermy for newbies through workshops and lectures, and is committed to making the field more inclusive by using her platform to advocate for the authentic presence of underrepresented voices in the field. All animal parts used in today's demonstration are legally and sustainably obtained. That's something that's very important to Divya. And um, I think with all of that said, I, I will turn the mic over to Divya and uh, uh, wait with bated breath as she gets <laughs> through um, some of her presentation today. And, and I guess the last thing I'll, I'll say is that in addition to being a great artist, uh, something that I've come to appreciate about Divya is certainly her, her passion for um, social justice as it pertains to both uh, principles of equity that span both the human and the animal world. So with that said, I welcome Divya. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. What a sweet introduction. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, thank you so much to JD, to Apex, and to Morbid Anatomy for having me. This is really um, an amazing opportunity to share a little piece of what I love with so many people who love it too. Um, so today I'm going to cover a few things about taxidermy care. Um, since, as we know, this exhibit is focused on historic taxidermy and collecting and the art and passion and drive behind collecting. Um, I'm going to talk about taxidermy care and maintenance and show you some ways to care for your taxidermy, especially with older pieces. Um, you know, a lot of us that collect taxidermy, whether we're collectors like Josh or collectors like me who just have like two cool things, <laughs> you know, um, we all are drawn to these animals and sometimes, um, especially with older taxidermy, it can be falling apart or it can be a bit dusty. It can kind of be um, 
you know, it can kind of be a little rough. Um, and caring for, you know, and caring for modern pieces and older pieces, there are some similarities and some differences. Um, it's often a lot easier to find information about modern pieces because a lot of us buy our modern taxidermy directly from the taxidermist. Um, and so that person who made it will tell you how to care for it. They'll tell you, you know, they'll tell you everything you want to know about it because they're passionate about their work and they're passionate about these animals. Um, and even if you don't buy modern taxidermy directly from the taxidermist, it's usually pretty easy to track them down. So it's a lot easier to, to care for modern taxidermy in some ways than it is to care for historic taxidermy where the maker is no longer here in many cases. And sometimes even their family members and next of kin might not even know that they were taxidermists sometimes or they might not be here um, at all. So it can be a bit tricky tracking down provenance. So in caring for taxidermy, kind of going into those basics, I have a slideshow I'm going to share. So I'll just share my screen. And if everyone can see that, here we go with some taxidermy care. So to care for taxidermy, we'll first have to understand what taxidermy is. You know, that root word for taxidermy, it comes from the Greek taxi, which is to move um, or arrange, and then derma or dermis, which is skin. So taxidermy essentially is a pretty simple concept. It's mounting the clean and preserved skin onto an anatomically accurate or anatomically inspired form. Sounds simple, but there can be so many variations. So these are three very, these are three lions. They're three very different lions. They've been executed very differently, um, all with very, very different results from different time periods. So you can see that the execution of taxidermy, even though it's a skin on a form, it can vary widely and wildly. Um, so each of these, each mount, even if it's made by the same person can vary, you know, can have quite a lot of variants too, just depending on a lot of, depending on a lot of factors. But the only thing original in taxidermy is the skin. So all the other parts, the eyes, the soft tissue detail, sometimes even the teeth, sometimes even um, the heads and the feet and, you know, other parts, like sometimes on birds, the heads are fabricated, sometimes the feet are fabricated. So that just throws a lot of variables in to, um, there's a lot of variables into the mix as far as what what can what can go wrong or what can go right with taxidermy. So we're going to kind of examine some of these elements and get a better understanding of what can go into the care with all of these different variables. So the first variable is the form. So taxidermy is built on the form, right? So this is what is underneath the skin of the animal. Um, this first slide here shows this really beautiful, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in a museum to me. Um, this is at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and they have this beautiful preparation where they cut away layer by layer every single piece of uh, every single layer of this taxidermy preparation. So you can see the skin, you can see the layer of mache on the form, you can see the form underneath, you can see the armature underneath that was that that form was built on. Um, it's really, really beautiful. It's really incredible. Um, Modern taxidermy forms are made with urethane foam mostly. They're commercially made. Um, here's one that I've pulled up. Um, I'll hold it close to the camera so you can see it. This is just a modern taxidermy bird form. You can kind of hear it. You can kind of see that it's, it's lightweight. Um, but older taxidermy was made from a bunch of different materials. So some of those materials were wood wool, which I also have a little bit of here, which is this is unbound and dry wood wool, so it's shredded up aspen wood. Um, some older taxidermy forms are made from sisal, from jute, from hemp. Um, sometimes they were made like this, where there was a wire armature underneath, and then something was sculpted on top of that. Um, sometimes even the real bones were used. There are a lot of taxidermy forms where there are skulls packed with wood wool and then sculpted over with a layer of plaster or clay. There are hollow taxidermy forms made from plaster, uh, or sorry, made from paper. Um, there are some made from mache. There are taxidermy forms made from fiberglass. Pretty much any material that you can think of that's been used in sculpture um, or used in armature making, it's also been used in taxidermy. So when it, comes to, when it comes to caring for your old taxidermy, knowing what's underneath is really important. Um, I've also got some other really fun slides. This is an illustration of 
a, a tax reform being made that's far bigger than anything I've ever worked on, but you can see this metal armature underneath and these bones that are wired and kind of secured on top of which um, on top of which the taxiderm is the sculpting. There's this really cool x-ray, which I love, of a bird just showing nothing but the little wires holding it up, holding up its neck and its legs and a little bit of its tail and wings. Um, this is another really beautiful taxidermy form, um, the image on the color photo, which is on my left, but I think maybe it might be on your right, depending on how you're seeing it. Um, this is another cutaway. Um, this one was in the, um, is in a natural history museum in Arizona. And this one shows, you can kind of see the side that has the skin and you can kind of see the other side where it has the wrapped fiber, um, those skull that's been packed and sculpted over. And then those ear liners there, the ears are being held up with what looks to be a really thin piece of metal, most likely lead. So you can see that, you know, those forms are a lot different than this piece of foam, this foam nugget that we can buy from a taxidermy supply company or sculpt ourselves. It's a lot, it's a lot more, um, you know, it's a lot more of a different material and all of those materials have different properties and they all interact differently. They all age differently. So it's really important to know. Um, and that's not to say that the old forms, a lot of times I also hear people saying like, oh, those old forms aren't good or that the new forms are better because, you know, this is slick and modern and foam and it's, you know, a modern material, it's lighter weight. Um, I don't think that because a lot of these old forms, we don't know how this ages really. Um, this has only been around for so long, um, but we do know how this stuff ages because it's been around for hundreds of years. So, um, you know, I kind of like using, you know, as much as there is foam involved in, you know, in modern work, you kind of can't get around it in some ways, but I really do like using those older materials, um, which is sort of maybe a, a modern method of packing it together or something. Um, they really do, you know, we know how they age, we know how they hold up and they kind of, um, you know, they kind of expand and contract with the skin in certain ways if it's prepared, you know, if things are prepared properly. So it's really important to know what is underneath your taxidermy before, you know, before caring for it. Um, oh, here's some more forms. Sorry, <laughs> I was like, I thought I really went on to forms here. So these are some more modern pieces. So there's one, um, a, a modern wrapped body for a bird. That's this stuff. It's been soaked and then wrapped around a wire armature. Um, and then a modern foam form showing some clay while the eye is being set. And that's for, um, I believe the bird one is for a partridge or a, ch a chucker partridge or some sort of small partridge. And the, um, the mammal one is there, it's for a rat. So our next thing to consider with taxidermy when caring for it are the preservatives. So a skin can be preserved in so many different ways. Um, and sometimes, you know, in older things, like sometimes we think of, when we think of like the history of taxidermy, we can think of mummification, we think of, you know, we think of all types of animal preservation as opposed to just taxidermy by itself being the skin on the form. So as far as preservation, there are probably just thousands of methods as far as we know from every single, you know, from every single culture. But as far as taxidermy, there are only so many ways to really preserve a skin. Um, I kind of break it down into three separate ways. So there's just drying the skin out, which means just cleaning it and drying it and doing nothing to it which is definitely not ideal because you want some kind of chemical preservative to, to act on the skin. Um, and there's also um, tanning the skin and then there's dry preservative on the skin and then there's also preservative paste. So with all those ways of preserving a skin, it's also important to know how well a skin was cleaned. Um, it's really a good predictor of how well that skin is going to age because the cleaner it is, the um, easier it is for the skin to absorb a preservative and the less grease and stuff left behind will prevent things like grease burn um, or grease leaching out or oil literally leaching out onto the skin and onto the fur or feathers of a piece um, and things like that. And you can see that a lot of times. I see it a lot of times in old bird taxidermy where the tails are falling off. The tail is almost always orange or dark yellow inside. Um, once it falls off, you can see that all that orange and dark yellow grease just just sitting there and aging and rotting um, and it's not great. Um, so here the photos show you a rat that's being skinned with borax. So it's just skin that's being, you know, skinned with some borax. Um, 
There are some clean feather butts here. This is from a peacock strain. So all of that fat was picked out underneath. And then of course this photo of this old timey tanning process that's going on. So you can see here, this person is scraping the skin, scraping all the fat and viscera and layers of the skin and thin it, thinning it out so that tanning process can be done. So very generally speaking, mammals are almost always tanned and tanning is a process where a raw skin is cleaned and then it's chemically modified to become leather. And so there's all kinds of tanning chemicals. There's chrome tanning, there's alum tanning, there's vegetable tanning, there's brain tanning. There's, all, there's just a number of methods of tanning. Um, but for taxidermy, for the most part, we're not using brain or vegetable tanning. We're using more of the synthetic chemical tanning because that just yields a better, yields a longer lasting result. Um, and a bit, another thing that a lot of old taxidermy suffers from is acid rot, which is when the leather deteriorates from excessive acids. So that's one thing to look out for in tanning. Um, tanning is a great process, but it's only as good as the person tanning it. So if someone was a novice tanner, or if someone was just a hobbyist tanner, or they might have just been like, oh, I'm tanning my first thing. And then you buy this, you know, 100 year old mount that was tanned by a novice tanner, it could possibly be experiencing issues, even though it was, you know, even though it was preserved, even though it was tanned. So just knowing something is tanned is good, but nothing is bulletproof un unless it's, you know, unless that process was done, done very exactingly. So it's just another, another thing to think of when you're, when you're looking at older taxidermy. Um, then there are the animals preserved with preservative paste and preservative soaps. I think one of the most famous ones is the arsenic soap because that just revolutionized taxidermy. It made everything last so long. Um, but it wasn't so safe for people, I guess. So we're not using it anymore. It's been regulated away. Um, but there are still other preservative pastes that are in use today. And there are a number of recipes. If you look at old taxidermy books, there are a number of recipes for, for non-arsenic and arsenic preservative paste. And those are generally brushed onto um, a clean skin. And those pastes are um, kind of like a peanut butter consistency or kind of like a viscous consistency so that they stick to the skin and then they slide. Um, will slide the form underneath it. Um, and then the other way of preserving is dry preserving, which is using borax, which is um, sodium tetraborate. It's a powder. They sell it now as a laundry as a laundry additive, but it's been used for, for quite a long time for preserving, um, for drying and preserving animals in their, their skins and hides. It's used a lot on birds. There are also other dry preservative powders that have various recipes. So there are some that have the finely powdered borax, some will have some alum mixed in, some will have talc mixed in, some will have diatomaceous earth mixed in. There are, again, a number of recipes. So many, you know, there's, every taxidermist probably has their own, their own little recipe that adds a little bit of this, a little bit of that as what they were taught or as what they um, have experimented with and like the results of. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a lot of variance there too. And it's mostly birds that are dry preserved, although sometimes um, smaller mammals like mice and chipmunks um, and rats and really small ones can be preserved. Um, those skins can be flushed and preserved with borax too. And with any unknown chemicals, the thing I hear a lot about old taxidermy, people are afraid of arsenic. They're afraid of being exposed to bad chemicals or afraid of, of something really toxic or something poisonous, um, you know? <laughs> Being, you know, being exposed to something that's really, really uh, unsavory. So I always say it's like anything, proceed with caution. You know, you don't want to expose, you don't want to inhale it, you don't want to taste it, you don't want to, um, you know, put it in, you know, you don't want to ingest it in any way. Um, I always wear gloves when I'm cleaning old taxidermy, mostly because my hands are sweaty and I don't want to transfer my own soil onto the old taxidermy itself. But you know, to pre prevent anything unsavory getting into the small cuts that are inevitably on my hands. Um, I always just wear some, some nitrile gloves. Um, you can also wear a respirator or a mask that's rated for, you know, that's rated for chemical exposure too, if that makes you feel comfortable while you're cleaning old taxidermy. Um, as far as keeping it in your home, there's not really, I mean, there are, there's going to be exposure, I guess, to any chemical, but I also, I also think of it too, I live in New York City, I just go outside and I'm exposed to so much bad stuff that I don't, you know, I've just given up, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to like, you know, lick some old arsenic taxidermy. I wouldn't suggest anyone do that, but I would say, you know, take calculated risks and do, you know, and, and do the research. And there's also, um, I've also been looking for articles about, you know, for scholarly articles about exposure to chemicals and taxidermy. And I can drop one into the chat. There's one that I found, it's from 
2017 from the Journal of Occupational and Medicine, Occupational and Medicine Toxicology. And they actually tested a few um, museum employees who were exposed to specimens with arsenic in them. Um, I think they were taxidermy and study skins. So it was interesting. They basically said, um, you know, I can drop it into the chat. I think there needs to be more studies done because there aren't many, I think it's a very specific area of study. I think it'd be amazing to, uh, to test collectors of taxidermy and see how much they're exposed to it, to see how much taxidermists themselves are exposed to, exposed to it in their work. I think that'd be a really cool thing for, for further research, but basically the jury is out. I, and I would just say to, you know, there's no like prescribed way of safeguarding, you know, the, the only prescribed way of safeguarding yourself from chemical exposure would be to wear proper PPE and to do that. So and we all and we all know about that at this point, Divya. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, we should all know about well, we so, should all know about that at this point. But I, you know. I, yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> you know, it, just on that subject, I've I've heard of entire museum taxidermy collections being incinerated. Uh, due to concerns about ar arsenic, simply based on the fact that they were old and presumed to have arsenic, whether they actually did or not. So what you're suggesting is use good judgment. That might be extreme, right? Uh, to have to yeah, burn. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> that people are, and, and certainly anecdotally, I'm also aware of many people that don't want that kind of taxidermy in their home, but unless you're ingesting it or being uh, otherwise, um, I don't know, uh, just doing something Trying. super, yeah, super, super off the wall. It probably yeah. is, is a manageable risk. Um, yeah, it's like anything, you know, like it's, it's a risk, like anything, it's taking a risk. You drive a car, you're taking a risk. You go on the subway, you're taking a different risk. So anything, it's managing that risk and being, you know, being mindful of it as well. It breaks my heart to think things were instant that these historic collections were incinerated on the presumption of arsenic being in there because yeah, there are ways to handle you know, there are ways to handle those things and keep them in case or enclosed and oh, yeah. all that work. And this is uh, that particular collection purportedly had a full mounted okapi, which is one of my oh. favorite animals and certainly a dream piece for for my collection oh, that was apparently burnt, anyone, burnt, my burnt up. Um, I noticed that there are at least one or two questions coming in through the chat. Maya, do you want to convey those to Divya or should I, should I? Go for it, JD. All right. So one of the questions that we have from Elisa Temple Cox is, can borax powder be used to control insect predation on older taxidermy, such as study skins of birds, um, or... Uh, or on found naturally mummified animal corpses. Um, and I guess as, as an alternative, would freezing be preferred with respect to dealing with the, the insects, which are obviously the, the bane of uh, the existence of most taxidermy collectors. Um, they can be extremely devastating and rip through collections pretty quickly. Um, and you know, I, I've seen a lot of tears my own and, and, and others uh, that have resulted from that. So what do you recommend with respect to dealing with insects more generally, borax or something else? Yeah, so borax does help, but it's not permanent. The best, most permanent, awesome thing was arsenic. That stuff just did not, it just, bugs just did not like it, but we don't, you know, but we don't use it anymore. With the borax, it does help deter insects, but I've also seen, um, I've also seen taxidermy or mummified pieces um, or things that weren't fully cleaned. I've seen taxidermy that wasn't fully fleshed or um, smaller mammals, like where sometimes all of, like if a lot of the meat in the paw was left in on something like, um, I don't know, something like a rabbit, if you left a lot of the meat in the paw in there or something where it should have been skinned out and you just put borax in there. Insects can be, in those pests like the moths and beetles, they can be attracted to that even if borax was used. So borax works, but it's not, nothing is permanent. So um, when I show the cleaning, I'm actually gonna show what I do probably every couple of weeks to my taxidermy, which is applying um, and fluffing some borax through the fur just to help, you know, just to help keep it refreshed in a way to help kind of keep some of that residual, like a bit of that residual pesticide in there. Um, but it's not going to be like, uh, I hesitate to say it's like a panacea or something because a lot of times I'll see people put borax on something and say, okay, well, it's done. Um, and it's not, 
it has to be it has to be maintained and the specimen itself has to be fully cleaned and and properly degreased and all of that too so there's so so yes and no i guess um and if you have an active insect infestation um the there's you know there are so many factors involved because i don't know if you have multiple pieces or if you just have one piece or if you have like a big room a little room a full apartment a whole house full of stuff so all of those are factors um in considering how to treat it um you can always freeze the piece if you have a piece of taxidermy that has you know that has bugs in it um i usually bag it and then freeze it and I put it through a freeze thaw cycle. So I'll freeze it for two weeks and take it out for two weeks and then freeze it again and do that a couple of times because um, a lot of times insects can go dormant. Um, I've thought out roadkill before that had the maggots come back to like, <laughs> had some maggots come back on it. And I sure as heck didn't have it out for very long and was like, wow, this is amazing. So, you know, with, um, because our freezers at our home freezers aren't as cold as you know facilities like a medical freezer or a veterinary freezer or something like that. Um, so we our home freezers, you know, if it's not cold enough in your home freezer, you might want to you would want to do that freeze thaw cycle to kind of shock them into uh, shock them into dying, which is a horrid thing to say. But we're talking about the moths and pests that attack our taxidermy, I guess. So. Sorry. Well, so, so <laughs> and, and to follow up on that, and you, you sort of alluded to the idea of home freezers not being as cold. Um, my, my extension question is, I've, I've had to personally had some, let's call it awkward conversations with friends and family members that went into the freezer and opened up the wrong package. Um, <laughs> thinking that it might be leftover food or something that could be put. Oh my in. gosh. Yeah. So that, that hasn't gone well. Um, <laughs> any tips for, for the, uh, an addition <laughs> in that regard? I would always say, why were you trying to eat my food? Like, that's what I would say. That's a lesson, the, a yeah, lesson okay. learned for trying to take, take the food that was mine. <laughs> they should have asked. Yeah, um, exactly. well, I mean, I have, I have like, a, I have chest freezers specifically for taxidermy. I know that's not the case for everybody. Um, so I would say if you don't have a freezer big enough for, you know, if you don't have a freezer big enough for um, the piece or, you know, in New York City, space is a premium. If you don't have space for a separate separate freezer, you can ask a friend if they have one. You can also contact a taxidermist. If you have a piece infested with, with um, mods or beetles or something, I always think if it's something that's over your head, contact a professional always contact a professional if you're not sure what to do because they'll be able to help you out um, as well. And again, freezing, like the freeze and thaw cycle, like usually like I've done it with wool sweaters in my in my food freezer because I didn't want to put my sweater in with my dead animals because I didn't, just didn't want that that smell going on to my wool sweaters. Um, and I've killed mods on my wool sweaters in my, you know, in my food freezer, which which worked. But again, it's that that freeze thaw cycle um, that's important to do. And, you know, without knowing the temperature of your freezer at home, I don't know, you know, I don't know how, how cold it is or how effective it, it would be or how long it would, how many cycles it would take. So it would be until sure. you see it. Um, fair, fair, fair enough. One more, one more question. Um, let's see, got a couple things. Well, I have out. a last thing to say about, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I use these traps, which are, I don't think I have one easily accessible here, um, shockingly. But there are these pheromone moth traps. They are just baited with a moth with a pheromone that attracts the males, and those are really good for kind of checking on an infestation or controlling um, controlling moths in your home because the males are attracted to that trap. To whatever pheromone is in there, it's a sticky trap, and they pass pretty quickly on there. Um, yeah. So those those moth traps are good to monitor um, any infestation in your home. All right, so not to uh, uh, dwell too much on this topic, but there are a couple more questions and I, and I have one as well, which I'm just gonna throw mine out there first, which is I've also seen people uh, be, be very concerned about moth infestations when they've seen evidence of moths on a piece that may be in their collection. And, and certainly that's understandable, but I've found in my experience that the moths uh, and beetles, also other pests that, that we deal with in this circle, tend to favor particular pieces. And just because you may have 
a moth problem in one piece and it may be around other pieces doesn't necessarily mean you need to panic or throw all your pieces away or yeah. do a massive bug bombing um, necessarily because they, they do seem to be fairly selective in a lot of respects and, and particular. Have you found that as well? I find that they're attracted to some pieces and not others. I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason to it. Usually there's, usually if something is meatier or something has more like, basically if it's like jerky, if there's something, if there's a lot of tissue inside that's attractive to them, then they're going to go there. Um, that's what I think it is. You know, there, if there's a lot of fat or if there's a piece that wasn't flushed, fully flushed properly, there's that. But then they'll also go after something like a wool sweater or a fur coat where there is absolutely no tissue left behind. So there's something about certain pieces where they go, where they go onto it, where they want that. Uh, that one tastes good to them. Delicious, I'm sure. Um, all right, a couple um, more questions. Kevin asked, do you, do you suggest a modern mount saver? And I assume talking about different kinds of uh, chemical compositions that are used to preserve and protect. Is there a particular one that you use or do you recommend those more generally beyond what you suggested around the sort of borax maintenance? I usually, honestly, I usually vacuum and plug up holes. I feel, I feel like prevention is the best method. I mean, because that way you're not getting the problem to begin with. There are modern chemicals like Mount Medics, Mount Saver, um, both of those chemicals I've heard people have really great experiences with. I've used them to clean my old taxidermy. I haven't used them to get rid of a current infestation or anything. So I don't, I can't speak to, you know, personal experience with that, but I've heard a lot of people do like those, um, they do like those chemicals. I've also heard a lot of people who really like using permethrin. Um, with that, if you have cats, it's really, really toxic to them. I don't know if it's toxic to dogs, but um, it's pretty fatal. It's safer for humans, but it's pretty fatal to cats. So I don't use it at all because um, not in here, but I have cats. So I don't use that. So there are, you know, there are those two are things that I've heard people using, but I also think too, you know, cleaning it, agitating, um, agitating all that fur and feathers and stuff and getting it, making sure it's actively clean um, will discourage moths from wanting to go there. Because, um, and if you think about even the wool, coat, wool, wool sweaters, fur coats, anything like that, the moths are really getting in there, not when you're wearing them, but when they're stored away for the summer or when they're stored away for, you know, for the off season. Um, or in the case of a fur coat is pretty freaking fancy. So you're storing it away until it's a, you know, special occasion. So they're only there when it's like a dark place. It's, you know, the fiber is the food and they sure. want to get into that. So agitating them, rotating them, fluffing them out, cleaning the stuff, it just discourages that just naturally helps discourage them from wanting to go there. Um, and then cleaning and dusting and all of those things are really helpful too, because they, you know, they like the dust. They like to be in, you know, think of where you see a moth in like an old dusty library, you open a book and it's flying out. Um, it's cool absolutely. for the vibes, but not for the practicality. Absolutely. So last quick question. I want to not take any more time away from uh, actually okay. seeing your, your work, but the, really quickly in terms of like essential oils or other natural preservatives, mm -hmm. cedar wood, lavender, et cetera, to repel bugs. Have you heard of anything like that? And can you speak to its efficacy? And if the answer is no, <laughs> that's fine. It does, I'm, I hate to say it, but it doesn't work. Like the concentration you'd have to maintain is really high um, for it to work effectively. And at that high of a concentration, I would worry about its effects just because it's natural. It doesn't mean it's safe. So um, I've been burned by lavender oil before just from, from skincare products, not even from buying the essential oil. So um, I would say, you know, treat it like a chemical because it is, you know, it's a chemical, but the concentration of lavender or cedar um, that you'd need to have some effect on it, it just doesn't, it sadly doesn't work. So it's good to have, it smells good. I usually add it to my, you know, I usually add some essential oils to my preservative powder because I like things that smell good, um, but I don't add it for some efficacy. I know that people have had cedar chests and things like that, that have kept, that have kept mods away, but cedar is, you know, it's the whole wood. So if you wanted to store all your taxidermy into an opaque cedar chest that you don't ever take any of it out, you won't get to enjoy it, but it'll be, you know, it'll be in there. So maybe, um, <laughs> maybe something like a cedar lined cabinet with uh 
kind of airtight glass around it, that would be maybe like a good storage cabinet for, for, for the taxidermy. But I think you can't get around having to clean it. Um, if it's not, if it's not in a sealed up case, you can't get around having to clean your taxidermy and dust it. Good, good advice. All right. That was a, that was a good and interesting sidebar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Those, those questions are great. Um, so yeah, so from preservatives, so that's preservatives are one element um, in taxidermy. The next element is the adhesives. So there are many different adhesives that people can use for taxidermy. So there are, um, and this is to adhere the skin to the form. So these days there are, of course, like so many brands of commercially made hide paste. People also make their own hide paste. Um, in the case of birds, some people use um, acrylic caulk or silicone caulk or other types of caulk. Um, to help adhere the skin and to help give it some loft in certain areas and to help slide the feathers um, and to groom them. Um, and there are so many different recipes. Um, older taxidermy, there were dextrin paste, there were a bunch of homemade machés and so many adhesive recipes that, you know, that were there. Um, and so one thing to consider with adhesives in, in, your, care and, in your care and cleaning of taxidermy is, um, knowing the type of adhesive, knowing how that adhesive may have reacted with that tan or the preservative that was used because some of them are compatible, some of them are not, some only become non-compatible over time, all of that stuff ages differently. Um, sometimes the adhesive can react one way to humidity or temperature changes and the skin can start peeling away from the form or it can start drumming. Um, which is creating these wrinkles in the form. So that's another thing to, that's another thing to consider when you're considering your old taxidermy when you're looking at it. Um, some, pieces, uh, some pieces are also mounted with a layer of clay or mache or plaster underneath the whole skin and that was sort of massage to have all of the sort of muscular and detail and wrinkles in there too. Um, a lot of super heavy taxidermy feels like that because it has that layer of the sculpting medium underneath. So that's another thing to think of. Um, I've seen people rehydrating taxidermy and sometimes when you're doing that um, you have to keep that adhesive, you have to keep a lot of things in mind, but especially that adhesive, you want to know what adhesive is under there so you don't rehydrate something that you shouldn't, you don't rehydrate something too much or too little. Um, that's really, really important to keeping the integrity of the piece. And, um, and even in some cases, I might even say like, let's not even rehydrate this because it's not worth it. Um, we'll just sort of repair it in a different way because you don't know how that adhesive might act with the, with the um, introduction of water. So very important to know to know that um, another element in taxidermy are eyes, and eyes are I think super fun. I think they're amazing. Um, this is not my photo. This is a photo um, from a New York Times article, but and the photo is by Owen Smith. Um, but this shows just a beautiful array of eyes. Um, now old eyes are come in many different qualities. Um, glass eyes were made in so many different you know they're made in so many different ways. The, technology of glass blowing can be a whole other topic. Glass eyes themselves can be a whole other topic. Um, glass eyes from every decade of, or era of taxidermy can be a whole other topic too. There can be, there's so much in there, but in the two minutes I'm going to spend on, on eyes, just to let you know, they're very varied in quality and type and make. A lot of older taxidermy has unconventional eyes, and I've seen really, really amazing things. Um, I've seen marbles used, like not marbles like um, that were painted or anything, but just straight up marbles with the swirl and stuff in them. I've seen those used. Um, there's a really well-known passenger pigeon uh, taxidermy named Buttons, who has buttons used as the eyes. Um, and of course, there are also old eyes made from glass and made from those more traditional materials, but the unconventional eyes are something we see a lot in taxidermy. I've seen also BB pellets, like from a BB gun, painted with, um, you know, painted with gum and paint and uh, turned into taxidermy eyes as well. So they really improvise a lot, a lot of times with eyes. Um, and so they didn't have the commercial suppliers that we have today. With modern taxidermy or more, uh, more recent taxidermy, there are also acrylic eyes that are made, um, especially for birds. They can make a really beautiful result because you can get a shape in acrylic that you can't blow into glass. And it kind of, um, it kind of adds in that extra lifelikeness to, to birds. So you can see that, um, you can see that in a lot of 
newer taxidermy or in, or in more recent taxidermy. And eyes are important so you know how to clean them because you clean glass very differently than you clean acrylic. And if your taxidermy has a non-conventional eye in it, like if it has a gummed lead ball, you sure as heck don't want to put um, a solvent on that because you'll take that, you'll take that right off. Um, so knowing the kind of eye is really important to, to cleaning your taxidermy as well. You'll also want to know, um, you know, how that eye is set as well, because sometimes people say, well, the eyes aren't looking in the same direction and they want that repaired um, or not, I don't know. So repairing eyes is, a, you know, is, is an art in itself. Um, the other thing that can happen with older glass eyes, if they were painted, sometimes that paint can peel away from the eye, um, which can be really, um, you know, which can change the look of, can completely change the look of a mount because that eye no longer looks lifelike. It looks kind of scary with that paint peeling away from the back. Um, sometimes that happens if the eye is set into a sculpting medium that kind of pulls the paint as it dries and it doesn't age well, it doesn't age in a compatible way. So there's a lot to consider with eyes and taxidermy. I think one of the hardest um, things is probably replacing eyes in older taxidermy because finding, a, finding an eye that's historically accurate or period correct is really hard. Um, and finding ones that match, whether it's one eye or two eyes or something, like just finding something that matches is, is so difficult. So, um, you know, the eyes are the eyes are very special. And I also think in, in cases like buttons or in cases like some of the marble, sometimes those non-conventional eyes have, they might not be anatomically or scientifically accurate, but taxidermy is also a cultural artifact. So I think in the case of buttons, as heartbreaking as it is that they used buttons for, her eyes, um, it's, it signifies some, some part of that place and time that's really important too. So there's that, considering your eyes. And then there's sewing in taxidermy, right? So there's sewing, sewing the piece up. And with sewing, it's important to know the type of thread that was used. So you can use cotton thread, especially on something really lightweight. Sometimes people use cotton thread to sew up birds. Um, sometimes people use synthetic threads or monofilaments. Um, I've seen silk thread, I've seen every kind of thread that you can think of has been used in taxidermy. So all those threads age differently, they all hold skin together differently. So knowing the thread, you can be mindful of how strong or weak a piece is going to be. Um, and then sculpting materials. So I kind of touched on it in our form making, but there are sculpting machets, there's clays, there's waxes, and more recently we have this miracle compound that taxidermists swear by, it's called epoxy sculpt. We use it to create details um, such as, you know, eyelids or setting eyes um, and sculpting details such as nostrils, lips, um, eyelids, the paw pads, and other fleshy areas that will either shrink up or dry up during the taxidermy process. Um, but we use that now. Before they used to use, you know, clays, waxes, and other machets. And it's really important to know what was used so that when you care for your taxidermy, you take that into account. So for example, if um, you have a bird where the eyelids might have made, been made by thread dipped in wax, um, you don't want to take a blow dryer to that. That's really hot because you're going to melt your, you're going to melt those eyelids, um, which will be really, really sad. Um, or the same with waxes or certain machets, you don't want to take heavy solvents to them or something really, really harsh to them. So you really want to know what your taxidermy was made of um, with those sculpting, the sculpting materials before, before cleaning it um, and go really, really gently. And even with something like clay, clay can be water-based, clay can be oil-based, they're synthetic-based, there's so many kinds of clay. Um, the same with wax, there can be paraffin wax, there can be micellar wax, there are so many kinds of wax. So really knowing what was used um, and having a bit of confidence in that and knowing that, that material is, is pretty important before just randomly cleaning something. Um, and if you're in doubt of what material has been used on something, it's always good to go to a professional, um, to someone who knows about historic taxidermy or someone who knows about materials, honestly, because a lot of, um, a lot of modern taxidermy doesn't teach about the history of taxidermy. So knowing someone that has a bit of historic knowledge is good too. It's good to do. Then the other element here to think of are paints and pigments. So much like the sculpting materials, knowing the type of paint used so that you don't strip it, um, unless you really want to strip the, that paint when you're, when you're cleaning your old taxidermy. Um, there's oil paint, acrylic paint. Nowadays we use powder pigments too. Um, I've even seen makeup being used to paint taxidermy or to add color to those fleshy areas that might fade or to add color to parts that were sculpted. Um, so knowing that will help you, uh, will make sure that you don't use the wrong solvents to clean it. Um, but it also kind of helps you realize like what sort of elements um, that it might be exposed to that would um, that would harm it. Like I've noticed that things done with oil paint, I, I'm 
way more diligent about dusting them because they can tend to get kind of gummy. I tend to make sure they stay in drier rooms because I don't want them to get gummy or dusty or anything like that. And then so with all of this, this is a piece that I was one of the favorite pieces I have ever worked on um, at my day job or at my part-time job at George Jante Studios um, where I do restoration there. Um, and it sort of taught me a lot about, um, you know, being exposed to a lot more old taxidermy than just through friends like Josh and stuff, um, or just, sorry, friends like JD and everything. Um, and so with all of this, it's really important to keep in mind that caring for taxidermy means caring for all of these really different materials and they can come in all of these different combinations. Um, and it's so, so there are so many variables involved. And that history of taxidermy is so varied too and not everything being well documented. It's really important to be mindful of all of that before you, you know, before you take, uh, before you take some Windex to an old piece and start scrubbing it, you know, you don't want to do that. So I always advocate for really gentle and non-invasive methods um, as much as possible. And prevention, I think we were talking about the bugs, prevent, prevention being the best treatment. So keeping taxidermy in general, just generic rules that apply to all taxidermy, keeping it away from direct sunlight, away from temperature and humidity fluctuations. So not in your kitchen or bathroom um, or anything like that, or not by a sunny window, even though it looks cool, um, not doing any of that and regular and gentle cleaning and constantly monitoring for pests. Um, so, and if you are ever unsure of how to care for taxidermy, I always recommend reaching out to a professional. Um, I have a list of people in different, in different places who do, you know, who do, uh, taxidermy care and cleaning and conservation. Um, there are people, you know, there are people I know sort of all over that do that. Um, if you're in the New York area or anywhere in the U S I would strongly recommend George. I work there. So I'm biased, but they're great. Um, and there's so much, uh, there's so much knowledge there as far as um, there's so much, there's a completely different knowledge base and caring for taxidermy as opposed to being a taxidermist because you've got to study the history, you've got to study that materials compa compatibility. So there is, um, there's a lot of, a lot of different elements involved. Um, another thing with caring for old taxidermy too is sometimes I meet people who just write it off as crappy taxidermy or something that isn't worth saving and I don't see that at all. I think that it's really important to keep these things around as cultural artifacts. So, you know, preserving those pieces aren't just honoring that animal's life, it's honoring the efforts of the person who initially, you know, who initially took that time to, to preserve it. So, so yeah, so with all of that, I would say clearly everyone here is interested in restoration and repairs and caring for the taxidermy. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and show you how to clean a couple of pieces of my own. So I'm going to put some gloves on so I practice what I preach. <laughs> so, um, was, that, was that tiger a Roland Ward, by the way? No, it wasn't. That tiger, I don't know. I don't know if they know who made it, but it was really old. Um, yeah. It was really, really, really old. Like it was all plaster and wax inside. It was, it was, it was, it was dust that was being held together by skin. It was really, well, I, and as you're getting ready, I mean, I'll just say, I mean, I think that that example is a, is a good proof point, uh, the, the, the tiger, but you also alluded to it that, you know, a lot of times people assume that older taxidermy that may be damaged is unsalvageable um, or just junk to be thrown away. And it's amazing what a skilled hand such as your own can do with it. You I recently, mean. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, you, you, you recently worked on a pair of resplendent quetzals for me oh, yeah? that, that I thought were unsalvageable. This is a um, you know beautiful emerald green birds with a very long, probably three foot tail. Uh, this was a from a Victorian case, and I I was even I was going to write them off as garbage, and you were able to save them. They had been extensively damaged, and you brought them back to life, so to speak. So uh, it's amazing. I would encourage people to try to think about that. Uh, preservation and salvaging before they are too quick to throw things away because yeah there are so many it's so it's so true because I meet like you know I meet so many taxidermists who are like why would you keep that why would you want that and it's like in the case of I mean in the case of those kettles I'm like it's a freaking kettle like no you're not gonna get rid of this. you're not gonna get rid of this or in the case of something rare, like, a, you know, like a tiger, even like, you don't want to get rid of it because it's this incredible animal. Like everything is, I think 
in my head, I think everything is sal salvageable. I think one thing that I did at Georgia Studio that wasn't salvageable was a, a rug that was um, a bunch of flying squirrels had gone into it and um, there's a lot of poop in it and it was just not, it wasn't happening. Um, mm. It was, but it was the, the leather was falling apart and there was just a lot of like the squirrel activity. They had just destroyed it. Um, so that was a case where like only parts of it were salvageable. But I think most of this old taxidermy that's written off as like, you know, crappy taxidermy or bad taxidermy or like taxidermy or things like that. A lot of it is, you know, a lot of it has a charm in, in being aged and in being kind of different and old, but a lot of it is, you know, you're able to salvage some part of it. Um, it might, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, you know, a straightforward thing. You can't just like throw epoxy sculpt on everything and call it a day. That's not, that's not going to be the case, but you know, in the hands of the right person, it's, 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 it's definitely, definitely salvageable. So, Absolutely. all right. So I'm, I'm going to show you how to clean a few things. So I took some things out from my collection. So these aren't like client pieces or anything. So these are things, this is, this is what I was going to do. Um, probably this weekend. So I'll take these things out. So this is a little bunny I got at a flea market. So you can see it's not really great taxidermy to begin with. Um, but you can see the fur here is kind of matted. It's kind of not fluffy. It's kind of sitting here and, you know, it, it doesn't look really great. So I'm going to show you how I would clean this um, and sort of my routine maintenance of this. And I'm going to sort of get close so that you can see that if anyone wants to. If I need to adjust the camera, just, just tell me and I'll do that. So what I'm gonna do first is I know this has been dusted. I've been dusting it regularly. So I just have this sort of brush here. This is um, like an edge laying brush or just like a cosmetic brush. It's nice and soft and I'm just gonna brush out this fur. You can kind of see it feels a little oily. It feels a little, a little greasy, but I'm just gonna brush it out so I can, you know, kind of release some of that, um, some of that matted goopiness. Um, to see what what that will what that will yield to kind of aerate the fur to get some space between the fur um, to air it out. So I'm brushing it. It's funny. It looks a lot better on camera than it does in front of me here. <laughs> Hopefully, fluffed out, it'll look a lot better too. All right. So I brushed that out. That's there. So not a lot of dust came out of it, which is good because I wouldn't expect it to because there was no dust here. Um, then what I'm going to do now is I forgot to get some paper towels out. But I have some in here. And I have some clean paper towels, and I'm just going to give them a bit of a wipe to really make sure that there's no dust. Um, there's no dust coming out. And to make sure, um, because it does feel a little bit oily, I just want to make sure that there's no excessive grease or anything that I'd be able to see. And so it's pretty, it's pretty clean, not too, not too bad. So again, this is just something that was sitting on my shelf, getting a little, you know, just looking a little sad and matted, not. Does vacuum, vacuuming figure into part of this process, Divya? Do you, do you recommend that people vacuum their taxidermy? You could, you could vacuum your taxidermy. It would be really, um, it would just be really, really, um, you'd have to be really careful and it would depend on, it would depend on the type of taxidermy it is. Um, if you notice an insect issue, I almost always wanna brush out the, any of the frass and any of the larva and things like that. Um, and then go in and gently vacuum. Um, the problem with the vacuum is that it can just suck the skin. You know, if it's a really strong vacuum, it can just suck the skin <laughs> right off. Um, so if it's a sturdy piece of taxidermy, like my taxidermy, the stuff, my pieces that I've kept for myself, I vacuum those because um, I know that they'll hold up. Um, and there are a couple of, um, I got that, that deer head. I got a, that albino deer head from you. I vacuumed that multiple times. It's fine. Um, it's, it's sturdy and solid. But if you have like a delicate piece of taxidermy or something that's a bit iffy, I wouldn't recommend vacuuming it. Um, they also sell like variable speed vacuums. There are like conservation grade vacuums, which are really amazing, but are also like 
a couple thousand dollars. So, I mean, if you're, if you're at that level, if you can, I can't buy that, but if you can, you can. You got, you got, you got to be committed to, to make yeah, that. Yeah, if you're committed to it, you can, you know, do that or, reach, or honestly reach out to a professional who has those, you know, who has those items, um, you know, George Studio, he has those items there. So, you know, it's, I love using that vacuum. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, you can vacuum it, but just, you know, like any of anything else, it would have to be done really carefully. All right. What's next for our bunny friend? All right. So next for our bunny friends, since not a lot of not a lot of physical dirt came off. I'm just going to refresh this fur. I'm going to use my tub of dust here. So this is my tub of um, there's a finely powdered borax in here. There's a bit of diatomaceous earth um, and chinchilla dust. Well, ch chinchilla dust is like diatomaceous earth, it's like volcanic ash. So I'm gonna kind of put that here and fluff it through the fur. Um, and I'm gonna brush it through the fur. So you can see that it will get a bit fluffier. Um, I'm going to do it above this, um, just this Tupperware here. So you, I don't want you to think I'm just doing it on my desk and stuff. Um, I'm gonna kind of put my face a little farther back so it doesn't come into my, uh, so I don't breathe the stuff in. Um, if it gets on your hands, it's not a big deal because you're just going to, it's just gonna dry it out. But I like to not get it on my hands because my skin is dry enough. So I'm just going to fluff this through. So I'm just very gently putting my hands through. And you can see it's already kind of absorbing that excess. Uh, it's kind of fluffing out the fur. It's kind of absorbing any of that excess like dampness that might've been in there, or whatever that was whatever was matting the fur down, any of that oil, any of that maybe residual grease that was in here. You can already see how fluffy this is, just from like a few minutes of, or a few seconds of fluffing this. See how fluffy this is versus, um, you know, this matted part here. So I'm gonna do this again, just very gently, fluff it through. And again, with any of this, like if I were, if I were doing this on my own, um, not for a presentation, I would probably have a mask on and be doing this a little bit faster um, and probably a bit messier, honestly. <laughs> it would be, it would probably be over like a tarp or something um, for a larger piece, but you know, definitely be mindful of all of that while you're working with these things. Shake out any of that excess dust. And the other thing I'll do is um, have these brushes, which is, it's a toothbrush, but it's got a bunch of small bristles or it's like super fine. And you can, you can see the dust that's already coming out of it, but these are, it's, if you look up nano toothbrush, I got this on a targeted Facebook ad. Um, but if you look up nano toothbrush, you can, you can find them and they're awesome for, for fluffing and cleaning, um, for fluffing stuff and cleaning stuff. So now I'm gonna use that little brush to fluff this through here. Because this little bunny, I want it to be nice and fuzzy. I'm gonna go in a circular motion. Just like brushing your teeth, I guess, you go in a circular motion, right? And you can see that I'm being really gentle. I don't want to, um, I don't want to brush really roughly, I'm just sort of. I'm even putting my hand all the way at the very end of this brush so I don't put much pressure on it. Um, my dentist would be very impressed with the thoroughness of your technique right now. <laughs> if only teeth were this easy to clean, right? <laughs> I'm just gonna shake out any of the excess dust, but you can see how much fuzzier and fluffier um, he's become a little poof now. And then I would also, um, and I won't do this in here because I'm indoors and I don't want to breathe all this dust in, but I would also get a blow dryer and blow dry this um, so I can blow off any of that excess dust. I'll just shake off more of it onto this trash can here. So I'll shake it off onto here. But yeah, you can see here, it's a lot fluffier. Um, that's just been a little bit of, just a little bit of, of work that was done to this. So that's one way to fluff things. So if you have something, this is like what I do every, um, 
every weekend with my taxidermy. Um, the other thing I'm going to show you is cleaning the eye. I know this is a glass eye, so I'm going to go ahead and clean it with um, a bit of Windex, which is just a glass cleaner. You can also use alcohol too. That's fine. So I'll just wet the Q-tip. Um, it's the eye is dusty here from all the dust I put on it. So what I'm going to do is the dry side of the Q-tip. I'm just going to brush off whatever dust I can. A lot of times when cleaning eyes, people end up um, just going straight in with a solvent or a, or a glass cleaner. But I like to get that dry stuff off if there's any visible dust on there. I like to get that off first. And then go in with the side that I dipped into my Windex. That'll polish it right up. Excuse my awkward stare. I'm looking into the zoom to see this because if I look mm -hmm. down and face it to me, you won't see it. Audience won't see it. So no, it's coming, it's coming through great. I've noticed on older mounts a lot of times the there's a sort of chalkiness around the eyes. I'm not sure if that's um, you know, maybe plaster re residue. Um and would you would you recommend anything different there? I mean, I, I don't know. I think if we've at least I've been sometimes reluctant to get that uh, get that substance wet um, if it's yeah I, it's, or, yeah with plaster it's a nightmare because once you get it wet it just keeps making that coating and coating it keeps going and coating and coating it um, for that if a Q tip doesn't do doesn't get it away another thing I use for cleaning um, I use this for cleaning taxidermy old and new all of these tools like these old and new are these things which are um, these are called micro brushes and you can get them um, dentists use them. Um, artists use them, like all kinds of people use these, but it's called a micro brush. Um, they also come in better colors. I ordered pink ones and yellow ones, which are more fun. Um, but the white ones work as well. They work just as good, but these come in different sizes. So you can use those to get really into the corner. This is a pretty, like, this is, this one is, uh, doesn't say how big it is. It's, um, they come from like 0.3 to 0.5. They come in all sorts of small, smaller and smaller sizes. So you can use some of these. Um, I've also cut the tips off of these and just use the plastic to get into some really fine places because it won't scratch the eye. Um, so I've done that as well to help clean, you know, to help clean stuff up. But these are also also good to use. I'll kind of show you how to use that here, I guess. Or actually, I'm going to show it on the next the next sure. thing I'm going to clean. Um, because this is pretty much this is pretty much done. He's fluffed, and you can see that some of that residual dust will be left in here. Some of that residual borax dust will be left in here to help keep the, any new pests away. Um, so if I blow dry this, you know, I usually do it outside. Um, if I blow dry this, um, that a lot of that dust will come off, but that little residual coating, that sort of microscopic or maybe it's not technically microscopic, but that very fine, fine, fine coating will still stay on here and help protect the piece. Uh, it certainly looks like he's had a trip to the salon. Yeah, yeah, he got, we got, we got fluffed out more. So that's good. All right, so we'll go here. The next I have a piece which I got from a friend of mine, from my friend Ryan. This is a cat. So um, this is a very old piece, but I just love his attitude and his expression. But um, I got this piece last year and I haven't cleaned it so since then. So it's had, um, it's a head, you can see the top of its head, it's kind of oily. There's a bit of, um, you know, that hair is really matted, more so than the piece that I didn't clean, um, more so than the bunnies, you can see that. The eyes here, I'm not sure what they're made of, so I'm not going to clean them with the solvent. Um, and you can see that there's a bit of that, I think a bit of that white stuff that you were talking about, Josh, like around, around the eyes too. The corners of the eye kind of look really dry. So here, what I'm going to do is, since I can see that this is visually a bit like a bit like matted, and I hope the viewers can see that as well. You can see that this fur, you know, cats usually have fluffy fur like that. This is slicked back like a like the '90s. <laughs> so I'm going to bring this down here closer. Since I have my, just like a wipe here, I'm just gonna see if I can wipe any of that, you know, see if any of that fur will, will come cleaner if I wipe it. 
And this is just a dry wipe because whenever I see oil, I just want to make sure that there's no, um, that any excess oil is kind of taken off. The same with any dirt too, because if you get dirt wet, like if you think of, um, I don't know, if you think of like getting your shoes dirty or something, if you walked in like the beach, if you, you know, shake off that dust before hosing, you know, before hosing something down, it's a lot better. Um, I'm not going to take this collar off for the sake of this demonstration because it has a complicated buckle, but we'll just clean around it. You can see I'm getting some of that oily, it might not, let's see. Yeah, that shows up a bit better. You can see I'm getting some of that oily stuff off, um, whatever that residue is that's coming off. And then the next thing I'll do is I'll go back in with this brush. Um, and I'll brush this back and forth. So I'm going to go brush the opposite way to see if that fur will lift and it's lifting, which is good. Um, if I did this without trying to wipe some of that oil off, you might just be pushing that oil into the fur, which would not be good. Um, so since most of that residue came off with that dry wipe, I would, didn't go in with the solvent. So just brushing this back. And again, I'm going really gently. Um, I'm not really using, this is not a stiff brush. So this is meant to be used on, you know, your eyebrows or on your, um, on your like baby hairs and stuff. So it's, it's gentle enough for something alive. It's usually gentle enough for something not alive. Speaking of being gentle, if the hair started to come off at this point because it was an old mound or maybe it had been damaged by insects, what, what would you recommend? I mean, do you reattach the hair with glue or? or you could the reattach the hair. You'd want to know why, um, you'd want to know why the hair was falling off. Um, if it was insect damage, I would just basically, you know, brush off what I could and then fumigate the piece and then go and clean it afterwards. Um, but yeah, because if, it, if it's falling, or if it's falling off from like acid rot or if it's like pieces of the skin falling off and, that's like a much harder thing to address because that's the, the, that's in the leather itself. There's no real um, fix for that aside from using a specialized like bonding technique for that leather. Um, so you'd want to do you want to you want to know why it's coming off and then address that before before going into to cleaning to cleaning it up. Um, and as far as reattaching hair, there are so many different ways to do that. Um, there are a lot of different. Basically, in every single, every circumstance, there's just a different thing um, that you can use to reattach it. So, a lot of glues have acid components. Yes. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, yeah, yeah, so that's a really important part of, of reattaching here is finding the right glue as far as its, you know, its pH and chemical composition and finding the glue that's the right consistency as well for the hair that you're attaching. So if you're you know, doing a little peach fuzz, you'll use a different glue than um, if you were to be doing something very, very, uh, you know, very, very long and, and lush. So the top of his head has already improved a bit. <laughs> it looks more like, uh, again, he's not gonna look brand new, but it's much fuzzier. Um, then what I'll do next, is I'm gonna go in with a stiffer brush. So this is a much stiffer brush than that eyebrow brush. And I'm gonna see how that, um, see how that treats the fur as well. You can see it's really moving. It's going, so that's good. And this is just gonna help get out any really stubborn dust and stuff that might be embedded in here. But again, I'm not using like a wire brush or anything like that. I'm just using pretty soft, soft brushes. Even this, even though it's a hardware store brush, it's still pretty, pretty soft. Then one trick I do is to make a brush stiffer is just hold the bristles lower and then it gets stiffer. Not exponentially, but it just helps go, go stiffer. All right, I'll do that. And then let's see what else I can do. Oh yeah, I'll come back in and fluff 
fluff the top of his head through, and then I'll clean this eye. I'll show you how to do that. And so here, because of the plaque, I don't want to get any of the dust. It's not bad if I get dust on this plaque, but I kind of want to avoid that because old wood is super porous and it can kind of hold on to um, and hold on to these dusts and powders in a way that I don't that I wouldn't want it to. And then I like the plaque as it is. So again, move my dust through the fur. And this time, since this hair is a little shorter and I want it to really get get in there, I'm going to use the stiffer um, the stiffer brush. And the other thing too, there wasn't excessive oil on here. There wasn't so much oil that I'd go in and clean it with a solvent. Um, but what's nice about this drying dust is that it'll absorb any of that excess oil that wasn't so um, that wasn't so so bad. Mm -hmm. You can see the top of his head looks a lot fuzzier now. I'll probably still brush it back because you know, cat's heads are you know he's in a snarling pose. And his hair would be, the hair would be brushed back as opposed to being standing up and fuzzy as if he was relaxed, but I still want that. Top of his head will look a lot, um, it will just look a lot better once it's, once it's clean and well. And here I'm not going in a circular motion. I just want to kind of go back and forth um, because I want to get the dust underneath and then I'll brush the hair back. And I really focused on the top of his head. I didn't clean the rest of him. So when the rest of him is clean, that will look a lot better. I have a bird I want to show you guys as well. So that will be fun to look at. All right, so his fuzzy head is here. And yeah. fluffed up. But now what I'm just going to do is just brush it back. Since this hair isn't so long, most of it, most of that dust fell out, so I'm not worried about it. So now I'm just going to brush it back so that his hair is slicked back, but not as slicked back as when it was was oily. So, you know, better looking top of head, not matted, that you can see. His head looks better. Definitely hair. much improved. Yeah, improved head. And here for the eyes, I would do the same thing. You could clean it with um, with a Q-tip, but you know that my Q-tip is not going to get into this corner of the eye here. So I'll come in with my micro brush. Where'd it go? I gotta open and get a new one. Those micro brushes can get lost especially if your desk is white and the brush is white and all the garbage on your floor is white. <laughs> okay, so here is that. Now we'll go in and then clean with one of these. And again, I'm sort of going in like with looking at it in the video screen. So I'm kind of hand-eye coordination is a little off. You can kind of see where I'm rubbing through. And you can see just with, um, you know, these were dry clean. These weren't, there was no solvents on any of these. So just even cleaning it dry, um, that's already made a big improvement. You can see this eye that was clean and this eye that was not. And that was just a dry Q-tip and a dry micro brush. So and it's I a little It's a little hard to pick up on camera, but I can say certainly from my own experience that it's amazing how much cleaning the eyes and that alone due to, make taxidermy sort of come to life. So it's certainly sure. well worth the time investment. I know we don't have a lot of time left. I do want to have some time for questions. I know you wanted to show a bird as well. Oh yeah, that's right. I know our talk and our Q&A went so well that I'll turn on my steamer and I'm going to show you very quickly on a bird, but I can talk, I can take questions while showing that bird if that's okay. Sure. Um, I don't think the bird will take much, take too long. So this is a bird that is really old and really ready. So it needs more help than I can show on this demo. It's funny, I thought I wasn't gonna have enough stuff, but of course I have too much stuff. 
So yeah, as, as you're watching audience, if you do have questions, go ahead and put them into the chat. And uh, as Divya continues to close us out here with the demonstration piece, we'll try to get as many question in, questions in as possible. All right, so this bird is a little tanager that has definitely seen a lot better days. Um, you can see these tail feathers are really, really, um, really, really chipped up. All of this stuff is really bad. So what I would do is um, get a Q-tip again, and I'm gonna dry clean it in the same way. So I'd clean this dry. And a lot of times with birds, their feathers, um, once they're cleaned, um, they'll want to behave a lot better. So I'll clean this dry. And then on this bird, um, I really try not to get feathers wet. So what I'll do with this, um, after cleaning it dry, not much stuff came off. I'll do another round with this cleaning. I see a lot of times with birds, particularly the tail and wing feathers, they sort of, and, and you mentioned chipping, I don't know if that's the same thing, but they sort of come out of alignment. They don't look clean. The, the feathers sort of branch off or the yeah. individual. Uh, so what I do for that paint. is use a bit of steam. Um, so this is just a garment steamer, like a travel one. And I'm pretty far away. It's kind of hard to tell on camera, but it's a bit farther away. So I'm steaming this in my steamer, whether it's a garment or taxidermy or anything, um, I use distilled water because you don't want to get any of that gunk um, or any of those that sediments, especially in New York City tap water, there's tastes good, but it's a lot of sediments in the water um, or a lot of minerals and stuff in the water. You don't want any of that mineral content in your steamer. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, steaming does help with it. And I'll kind of show you one of these tail feathers is pretty, pretty loose. So I'm just going to take it out and show you what it does um, to that. But some steam just helps kind of loosen all of this up. But you don't want it so loose that you damage the skin. So I'm being really mindful of keeping the steam really far away. And then with feathers, what you can do is I usually get, you know, this is a makeup brush and one of these feathers is, one of these is loose, so. So this feather was loose, so you can see how damaged it is. But what I'll do is with a brush, let's just realign all of that. And it'll seem like it's not going to happen, but it does. If you keep going, it will. You can see it's already taken a better shape. So um, anatomically speaking, there are what tiny hooks on the each one of those little strands that allow them to overlay and be kept together. And when they come out of alignment, I don't know, it would almost be like uh, yeah, it's like they're power curtain off its hooks or something like that. You gotta yeah, go. or it's like a zipper coming unzipped. So yeah, you can see you that's go. already put a lot of it. It's so, OK. Yeah, focus is better here. So that's already put a lot of it in alignment. The other thing I'll do too is just use my fingers. Um, that helps as well. I try to avoid it because honestly, when you see a bird preening, it's just using the tip of its beak. So I want to imitate that as much as possible. You can also use tweezers or at the end of a pin to do this too. But I like using the brush because it's soft, um, especially on these old feathers. This one was about to fall out anyway. So I was like, I don't want to. Uh, the barbs, the, the feather, um, the barbs themselves can be coming away from the shaft of the feather. So you want to make sure that you're not using something too hard that will um, destroy that feather. So you can see it's a little bit of work, but a big improvement in how that feather looks. Again, the edge, if this were a modern piece, like the, this edge here, where some of these things are overlapping, you know, that would need to be addressed. But you can see if I can even address it with some of these tweezers here. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that demonstrated in, in real time. I mean, really amazing. I mean, it strikes me a lot of this stuff, Vivian, I don't know if you can comment broadly, but 
there don't, there don't seem to be a lot of shortcuts. I mean, they're best practices, but there are not a lot of hacks here. There's not a lot of ways to sort of, you know, shorten that distance between, you know, the sort of A to Z that you have to go through on some of this stuff. This is yeah, there is time intensive, labor intensive stuff. Yeah, there, there really isn't. I mean, with good taxidermy in general, there is no, there are no shortcuts. Like there, it's, it takes a long time. Um, Josh, you work with me, you know, I take a long time in general. <laughs> I just take a long time for everything. But in general, with taxidermy, it just takes, you know, the stuff takes a long time. And with the historic stuff and cleaning older taxidermy, it really takes a lot of gentleness because, I mean, like I've done that steaming process to other birds and I've broken and melted so many things that, you know, I kind of like when I was first starting to collect this stuff, you know, I was learning with trial and error and reading old books and things. So mm -hmm. I've messed up enough to know that like there is no shortcut. I think a lot of the people in this field who have been in this field longer than me have said very similar things like there are just no, there are just no shortcuts to the good, you know, to doing a good job at it. Um, so there is that. I yeah. think as a collector at home, you know, if you're not a professional tax service, that shouldn't discourage you from collecting at all. I think collectors like Josh are like, they're kind of the stewards of these animals that, you know, that a museum might not want. Like, I would love to go to the Museum of Pet Taxidermy Dogs. You know, that's an amazing place, but there can only be like a couple of those. They're not gonna be at, they might not always be at a natural history museum. It might be more of like this, you know, very niche cultural thing. So I think that collectors are so important for that. And knowing how to maintain your collection is really important to, um, you know, to kind of keeping that alive and kind of not just keeping it for yourself, but all these like future generations of people who will come across it and think of like, oh, look at this weird old dog or this funny little bird. Like, what is the deal with, you know, what is the deal with this animal? So a couple um, questions have come in and I don't know if you, you can, continue your bird work there while I leave sure. them out in no particular order. Oh, here. I'll explain what I'm doing here oh, before the question so that you know what I'm doing. So what I'm doing now is after I steam this, I'm kind of lifting the feathers with these fine tip tweezers so that they lay in alignment. So before you saw that the back was kind of, you know, up and down a little bit. Ruffled, up, yeah. mm -hmm. A little ruffled up. Now I'm just laying them in alignment. So I'll do that while I take questions. <laughs> All right. Um, so speaking of hacks and shortcuts, Maya asks if people are turning to 3D printing for body forms uh, for taxidermy, as far as you're aware, is that something you've seen done in the industry? As yeah, of some people are, there are people doing, using 3D printing to help with, um, with body forms. I'm seeing it more in replicas. So there are, um, you know, bats, like a lot of bat skeletons are sold at oddities markets and things like that. Um, some of them are sourced pretty questionably. So there is someone named Forgotten Boneyard who's making these really beautiful 3D printed bat skeletons, which um, I've used them to make replica, replica taxidermy bats because that a lot of bat species are protected. Um, so I've used them for making those. Um, other artists have used them in their displays and things like that. And then collectors just, you know, people who like natural history stuff just collect them as a way to have uh, a legal and uh, a legal and a legal, not illegal, a legal and sustainable um, and ethical that, you know, that self. Certainly that would qualify as cruelty free. No, no. Yeah, doubt. for sure. Yes. Um, so I've been seeing people using, using 3D printing for replica, replica skeletons, replica parts, like replica bird heads and replica feet. Um, as far as for forms, it is viable. I think personally, like, I think it's just much faster to, and more cost effective to, as, as labor intensive as it is to, to sculpt and carve and make the mold, um, it's still more cost effective because right now the 3D printing technology is just not, um, it takes so long and it's, you know, it's a different kind of labor intensive and resource intensive process that it can be more cost effective and time effective to, to freeze, inject, sculpt, mold and sculpt and cast apart in certain cases. But I am really excited to see how it changes and how it grows because um, there are so many possibilities, especially in, you know, especially for people who want animals in their home, you know, as yeah. decor and as things like that. So it's really, really exciting. Yeah, it's good. Good point. Certainly does seem to have some promise as a technology. Yeah, uh, it's pretty cool. 
John asks, with respect to white feathers that may be dingy or discolored on a, on a bird, do you have techniques to either clean or recolor them to restore the natural white? So white feathers are so tough because they, even on a fresh bird, like washing a fresh bird, it's like getting blood out of it or throat pill or anything like that. It's, it's so, so difficult to keep white feathers pure, pure, pure white. Um, I would say with the, with taxidermy, I would say dry, cleaning it dry is good. Um, you know, using either a Q-tip or this is my other favorite tool. I can't use it on this. Everything I showed you was small, but using one of these like really soft makeup brushes that helps a lot um, and just getting the dust out. Um, I really hesitate to suggest solvents because you can use solvents. Like some people use like a very weak solution of, of alcohol to help wipe feathers down. But the problem with feathers is once you get them wet, you're kind of rehydrating and reintroducing moisture, um, those barbs, depending on how weak they are, you know, feathers have a shaft and then they have the barbs that stick out. So, so I've seen cases where a feather has been, like, you know, I'll usually do a test spot when I clean something before going to clean the whole thing. Um, I have a white peacock downstairs where I'm like, it's just going to be a yellow peacock because it, it just won't stay clean. It just won't clean up. But I've seen feathers, um, white and other colors, where that all of those barbs just fall off. Um, and all of those barbs just crumble. So with white feathers, sometimes the, the dinginess comes from dust. Sometimes it comes from nicotine if someone was like smoking. And, you know, I, I yeah. cleaned something where it was, you know, someone was smoking, we would sit in their armchair and smoke, and then this bird was hanging up here. Um, some of those stains aren't just surface level. They're like embedded into the feather. So with all of that, white feathers will be white, but they will never go pure, pure white. Um, what you can do is after you, what I would suggest is like after cleaning it dry, um, just seeing how, how it reacts to that. Um, and depending on the type of feather it is, you can try seeing if you can get a soft, um, you know, a soft brush. And like I did with the mammals, see if you can brush some, some of the fine borax in it and see if that helps kind of, it works as a little, as like a gentle abrasive. You can see if that helps take any of the, of the stuff off of it. Um, and I would and what, suggest that, and then what? What about? I mean, at what point do you kind of throw up your hands in despair and try to look for paint, pigment, um, you know, any sort of dry pigment that you could potentially use to recolor white or otherwise? Is that is that something that you're doing on the feathers themselves? I mean, I not to go too deep like, down the rabbit yeah. hole, but briefly, it really I depends. I mean, sometimes like. With feathers, because they're so delicate, I prefer to keep them not like just to keep them untouched. And coloration too, like coloring feathers, there's like there are so many, I there are so many, you know, formulas you can use for pigments to color those too. It's so much, so much of that is on a case-by-case -case basis. So I would not want to say like, yes, use this, because I've yeah. I've seen this, I've seen suggestions thrown out and then it becomes like a mess. So I would, I would not want that to happen because so much of it is determined by how, what's causing that damage and what's causing that color fading and what's causing, you know, and what type of feather it is too. Like this tanager's feathers are structured differently than, you know, this Jay's feathers back here. So all right. because of that, I really struggle to say like, there is a, a one, one solution, but that's, that's, there is like, yeah, there is feather coloration. And and very, very, respo very responsible. Um, yeah. there, right, there is coloration for faded things. Um, mm. With white feathers, though, whenever I've seen them colored over, they always look like, um, a, they always kind of look like when you're hung over and you put makeup on, you know, <laughs> it's like you still like, you still see the hangover come through. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, it's like, okay, you still see it. You can kind of still see the the dinginess like come through. So I feel like with white feathers, um, getting them as clean as possible is good. And then, you know, just kind of being at peace with like, it'll never be, it, it'll never be fully, fully white, but it kind of is, it has a charm in that it shows, you know, it does show the age in that piece. Um, patina, patina, we call that in antique. Yeah, patina. Yeah. Right? patina. Yeah. And you um, can always, you know, you can always like call, you know, you can always call a professional too and see what they, you know, have someone come and assess the piece or have someone or take the piece of someone who can assess, you know, assess what the, what the damage is and do, you know, like do solvent tests and things like that. Um, 
Makes yeah. makes sense. So we're we're about ten minutes over, which is okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for those that have stayed with us a little bit. Yeah, over. I know. Uh, I, there, I was worried not having enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there was a question about the powder that you used earlier. You you mentioned that it was a mix of borax and other agents. Um, yes, it was a mix or, of um, finely powdered borax, which you can get from any taxidermy supplier. It's, um, there's a regular borax you can buy at Target. That's totally fine to use too. I like the really finely powdered stuff because it's almost like a baby powder consistency. So it's a mix of that. And um, I also added chinchilla dust in there. So it's about like 70, 30. And the chinchilla dust, you can buy it at a pet store um, or you can probably order it online too. It's for, okay chinchillas to roll around in to get to keep their coats looking nice and fluffy. I love using it for drying, you know, for drying fur, for drying feathers. Um, I tumble birds in it. The only thing is like, I wouldn't use, so this is that, that tub I have, I wouldn't use it for too many uses. I, you, can, you can kind of tell when it gets spent, it kind of gets clumpy um, and a bit gross. So once it's absorbed a lot of more oil than uh, it can take, then you'll want to throw it away and start with fresh. But yes, that's what I use. And then I also put a few drops of essential oils in there because I like how they smell, not for any other. It has no, no power aside from that. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Um, any final thoughts or comments on your, on your bird work here before we wrap up? For the um, I guess I'll kind of do this here. And I'm just sort of putting these feathers back into place back here. Um, you know, sometimes when you see a feather like this, where it's very, very unruly, I'll just tuck it in <laughs> so that it, it stays. With these older pieces, you know, you kind of don't want to force, you know, you really don't want to force anything. Um, that's one thing to really come to peace with with older taxidermy is knowing that it's not going to look new, um, but you don't want it to look new, you want to keep that patina. But let's see, I'll get, oh, this is another tool I use, a mascara brush that kind of helps Groom some feathers into place as well. This has some fuzz on it. So that's another way you can groom and clean your birds. Um, cleaning with a Q-tip is good. You can also help fluff up these feathers on the side here. And we'll do that. But yeah, tweezers and uh, little brushes are what I use for birds. I'm gonna turn this around and. You can see how that side is now smoother and cleaner. Um, yeah, so if there are any other questions, I'll take them. Trying to see if there are any other questions um, in the chat for those that are still watching. Certainly, thanks for giving us your afternoons. Um, there are yeah. a number of other events that are associated uh, with the Nature of the Beast exhibit. Uh, Maya has been posting them in the chat. Um, looks like there's one more question. I see the borax for the bird too. Yeah, the borax was used for the, well, not for this particular not bird. Not on this one, no. On this yeah. one, it didn't have, um, with the birds, our feathers are so delicate, like, and this didn't seem to have oil or anything on it. So I didn't use the borax to clean it. I just used the, um, I just used some steam and, my little soft tipped makeup brushes. So this one has like a round tip. This one has this edge tip. And these are just, you know, these aren't fancy ones. These are inexpensive ones, um, but they're soft. And that's what helped groom it back into place. I don't normally fluff a lot of borax through um, older birds like this. because sometimes those feathers can, can hold on to some of that powder a little too much. Um, it would just depend, it would just depend on you know, it would depend on the bird. You can use it to clean, you know, I've used it to clean off heavy soiling, um, but not just fluffing it through like this. You could, you know, you could always tuck some under the feathers and fluff it out um, if you wanted to have the pest, the pest control properties. But this bird lives in a glass case, so. Mm -hmm. doesn't not too worried about him or possibly her. Um, yeah. So Jessica is asking, would you, would you wrap up an older bird that you were restoring to try to, get the feathers to lay down properly or is that yeah. a technique for new mounts only? No, you can do that with older birds and it can really, it really helps transform them because over time, you know, people, 
old taxidermy goes through so much. It can be in someone's house, it can be in someone's attic, it can be in someone's basement, and those feathers can go all out of line. And so just like we do with new birds, when you wrap the feathers around, you know, carting them and, and using the string and pins to wrap around, you can definitely do the same thing with older taxidermy to help train it back into place um, and to help keep it clean. Sometimes it helps too, like the pieces I have at home, like sometimes I'll, one of the cats does something and I drop something that it wasn't supposed to and some things, uh, you know, some things feathers fall out of alignment and it's a great way to, to put them back, so yeah. All right, great. Well, I think that's probably all we have time for. Um, thanks, Divya, for sharing your, your afternoon with us and your work and your, your world. This has been super, super helpful. I think really informative. Um, I think certainly useful for me personally, as I think about <laughs> how to uh, uh, preserve um, my, my taxidermy. I'm gonna try to figure out how to carve out more hours in the day because clearly this yeah. is a time consuming proposition to treat. Yeah. I know, but every piece uh, you buy, it's another piece to clean. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to, 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 to go into each feather as you've done and kind of illustrate how to care for these things, really amazing and, and um, uh, a mind boggling labor of love, but, but also the <laughs> results are, are very clear and speak for themselves. Um, so thank you for, for spending the time to, uh, Thank uh, you. Share this with us. It was great. Um, I'll turn it back over to my friends at Apex Art.